Hello Vinyl Community! Another sunny day here in Franconia, Germany. Um, I've been uh, quite impressed with a uh, couple of people having their own VC channels and uh, they, they express such a deep and highly complex knowledge of modern music of the last 60-70 years. It's always very impressive. Uh, but today um, I thought I feel like uh, going for some obvious choices, uh, uh, so mostly records that are definitely not obscure in any way, um, because I've been uh, listening to uh, quite a lot of progressive rock in the last two days, and so those are the records I kept out of the shelf. Now. Um, the first one is actually one of my favorite albums of all times. It is uh, In Search of the Lost Chord by the Moody Blues, Moody Blues uh, third album. Um, this is a wonderful concept album, I think, uh, that is uh, musically extremely rich and basically doesn't get boring for a second. Uh, the, the music is really exciting. And you can see the backside. Now this came out of course on Deram. Uh, now this here is not an original pressing. Uh, it is a pressing I think from the late 70s but it has the original Deram logo. Um, this, this was, this was re-released in Germany by Teldec, yeah. Um, so this is wonderful music. On the one hand, if somebody asked me to put together a presentation of 60s music that uh, somehow describes uh, the vibe and uh, the atmosphere of the late 60s, um, this would be amongst those choices. Um, so it's a, it's quite an it's qu it's quite an adventurous album. In part, it's really very uh, whimsical, mostly thanks to uh, Ray Thomas, I would say. And uh, it has some amazing tracks on it, like Legend of a Mind and uh, The Actor. And of course the atmospheric uh, sitar driven OM. So that's really an album I can recommend to everyone. This should be in every shelf, in every collection. Now this one is a little bit banged up. Um, that's uh, Salisbury by Uriah Heep, Uriah Heep's second album. And the beginning of a trilogy of albums that were really extraordinary. Not everything by Uriah Heep uh, is very good, I must say. But uh, with this album they started a sort of a streak of uh, three uh, releases, uh, followed by Look at Yourself and Demons and Wizards, which are very fantastic. I mean, this is like uh, the early hard rock... Um, earliest hard rock music, very influential on other musicians, I think, of, uh, of the late 70s. Um, I mean, the the one flawed thing about Salisbury is probably uh, the, the cover design, which is sort of uh, awkward, to say the least. As you can see here... I mean, it's all kind of strange, right? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Now, um... um this has only exciting songs on it. Um, so this album, of course, has the famous uh, Salisbury Suite on it, which takes like 16 minutes and 22 seconds. Um, and um, yeah, I must say, back in the day when this came out, and this is probably 1960, no, no, 1970, I would say, yeah, October, November 1970, it was recorded. Um, so this was a time when almost every band that thought to be somewhat uh, progressive or uh, musically uh, non-pop intellectual in any way worked with an orchestra and there were a lot of these sort of orchestra experiments including uh, the Moody Blues on their second album and uh, of course the famous Deep Purple album and uh, Atom Heart Mother by Pink Floyd and Salisbury and I feel always like actually um, because it it doesn't always uh, work out that well, I believe. A lot of these albums would probably sound better without the orchestra. 
not in this case. This is one of the examples where actually this works very, very nice. And uh, they blend together um, orchestral parts and sort of hard rock parts in a very nice way. So yeah, a revolutionary album, I would say. Very interesting, very listenable. Now this one probably everybody knows. The Six Wives of Henry VIII, the first Rick Wakeman solo album with the famous Six Wives on the back. I don't think I need to say a lot about that because this is a well-known uh, production. Uh, uh, the only fun funny story behind it that I know is that uh, when Wakeman delivered the tapes to a and they were kind of disappointed because they felt like he forgot to put in all the put down all the all the vocal parts. <laughs> but this is an instrumental album. It was still very successful, even though uh, the the label didn't believe it could be successful as an instrumental album. Now, if you want to go deeper, you probably want to go with UK, um, sort of a prog rock supergroup with their only album. So this is Eddie Jobson, Alan Holdsworth, Bill Bruford, and of course on bass, John Wetton. That's the backside. A little bit banged up copy of this album. Basically the same as on the outside. Yeah. UK. Now this one is a little bit underappreciated. It's the Emerson Lake and Powell album that came out in the 80s. Um, I guess people all thought why can't just these guys get along and just do what they're supposed to do? But um, yeah, so you have suddenly ELP with Cosy Powell on the drums. But uh, it's certainly no loss um, because he was an excellent drummer, of course. Um, I kind of like this album because the sound is rather original. Um, this is uh, the backside. And the inside it looks like that. So there are some really good songs on it, um, and yeah, it's it's a sort of an upgraded vision of ELP, how they wanted to sound in the 80s. So it's more edgy, it's more uh, has a more of a sort of a pop aesthetic to it, but it's quite better. I think it's better than uh, well some of the stuff they tried in the 90s, I guess. Yeah, and while we are at it, here is a. Uh, uh, Brain Cellar Surgery by Emerson Slack and Palmer. Now this here is the... This is just a funny copy I have because it's an... Uh, it's a uh, Mexican production. So... Uh, so it doesn't... I mean, there's a simplified cover of course and uh, all the tracks are translated into Spanish. But here I have the original pressing with the famous visual art by Giger and of course the opening door yeah um, now this is by many regarded as the most important uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer album it comes with a nice Nice big booklet here, which is actually more like a more like a huge poster. All kind of visual tricks. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna open it completely here and fold it. Um, well, I mean, I really like the album. Um, here with the wonderful Manticore logo and uh, I completely understand the band's efforts to be independent and uh, uh, to do their own thing but um, well to be honest um, in parts it doesn't sound that good 
And I would say the problem is that it's uh, an album they made without Eddie Offord. And I think these progressive bands that worked with Eddie Offord, they benefited very, very much from his input as a producer and a sound engineer. And uh, they did their previous albums with him. And um, here, that was my cat. Shut up. But um, here they thought they can do it on their own, and I think the sound uh, suffers a little bit. Um, uh, it's really uh, I have I have this album, as you can see, in two vinyl versions. I also have two CD versions of it, and uh, one is a sort of a, a remastered version, and um, there's always something lacking. I mean, it's a great album. It has a lot of uh, wonderful moments. I love to have it. Um, but it it doesn't sound as good as Tarkus or Trilogy does, I believe. But maybe I'm wrong, and maybe maybe I just just uh, hear it wrong, and it is a highly subjective thing. I don't know. What do you think? So the last album um, is the Yes album, the third album by Yes. Now, uh, this is actually a first pressing, uh, which you oftentimes can uh, recognize because uh, it's before John Anderson dropped the H and John, as you can see here, which he did actually right after this album came out. So, this is a gatefold sleeve. I mean, the way the, the gatefold is designed is quite different than people did it, than, than the companies did it later. I mean, it's the only record I have that has this kind of a gatefold element in it, which is a bit different. I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> so, uh, the Atlantic Group, a bit banged up the sleeve, but um, the uh, Atlantic logo, famously orange green. So, yeah, I like the S album. I mean, um, it's a well known album. I certainly don't need to talk about it that much. It's another um, famous uh, transition record for Yes because it's the last album, of course, to have Tony K on it for quite a while. I mean, we all know he came back in the 80s. So that's inside the gatefold. Actually, if you look at the picture of Bill Bruford and you take a magnifying glass, you will realize that it's flipped. It's like looking in a mirror. Like they flipped the photograph to make it sort of more aesthetically pleasing in the ensemble of photos. That was a, a nerdy information, right? Um, yeah, of course here, the wonderful Chris Choir. So yeah, this is a nice Yes album that's still not so convoluted uh, like their later albums. Uh, so it's a rather accessible, accessible music. Uh, and if one would be kind of new to Yes music, it would be a really good start with this album. Uh, it already has all, all kind of interesting, amazing ideas. It's the first album with Steve Howe, and uh, so he really uh, pulls all levers of his craft here and comes up with all kind of amazing ideas. Um, although he's not, he's not a prominent writer on this album, that is mostly uh, Anderson and Squire, um, if you listen to it, it's, it has a lot of sort of exciting patterns and, 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 and playing methods, playing styles by Steve Howe, who's uh, using a lot of different guitars on this album. So, this is a really good record. Those were the days. It came out in 1971, which is my uh, birth year. And, um, I mean, 71 was like the year for really great records, I believe. Yeah, that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed it. This was some of the rather obvious choices uh, without the usual underground uh, flair to them. So, have a nice day and uh, see you next time.